Good morning and welcome to worship, Deer Lake United Church. My name is Reverend Heather Joy James. It's my honor and privilege to be here leading in worship this morning and sharing this time with you today as we mark and celebrate National Indigenous Day of Prayer. As such, I'd like to begin with a call to worship that is an acknowledgement of our kinship. Creator, we come together today as diverse, united peoples to give thanks to you, maker of heaven and earth. We come to listen, to learn, to sing and pray, to consider our place in the order of things that you, O oh God, have created and are creating. It is right and good to give thanks for the land on which we stand, for this wisdom we learn from indigenous peoples of the land that we are one with the earth, the water, air, animals, and plants. Such wisdom, our interdependence with all of life, is something too easy to forget in our busy lives. It is a gift and a challenge to us to remember. And so we take time now to acknowledge the land on which we live. Many of us have come from other places, arriving from distant shores, our families arriving years ago, or some of us more recently. When settlers came, they were met by others who were already here, already knew these lands, already lived rich and full lives based on ancient and proud cultures. We acknowledge with gratitude and respect that we gather today in worship on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam people and the Squamish-speaking peoples, whose relationship with the land continues to this day. O oh God, as we acknowledge the peoples who have lived on and stewarded these lands since time immemorial and their continued claims to this land, help us to become neighbors, that we might live together in right relationship, in reconciled and better ways. For we are all kin in Christ, all my relations with each other and this earth, its water, air, animals, and plants. Creator, let us be of good mind to reconcile the mistreatment of this land and to those who have been displaced. With thankful and respectful hearts, we pray in the name of your Son, Christ, the peacemaker and the sacred spirit. Amen. And so today we light this candle to remind ourselves and visibly affirm that the Spirit of Christ is with us always. And we say aloud together, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer. Will you pray with me? Holy One, you are our rock, a foundation upon which we stand. Fill our hearts now with your joy at your deep abiding presence. Encourage us by the teachings of Christ to live with care and compassion for self, friend, and neighbor. Bless us now as we reflect on our relations with indigenous peoples, our kin, as diverse, united peoples. Amen. I'll invite you now to join in saying a new creed together. 
We are not alone. We live in God's world, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Compassion and forgiveness belong to our God, though we have rebelled against God. And so the invitation now is to renounce our willfulness and seek God's mercy by confessing our sins and sharing in repentance and faith. I want to invite us to say now together, you can follow along, an open prayer for the students of Kamloops Residential School that was composed for the United Church of Canada by our moderator, Richard Bott. O oh God, we are grieving. O oh God, we are shocked. O oh God, we are horrified. But God, if we truly listened, we can't be surprised. The elders and the communities had already told the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, told the governments and the world, the stories of the children, dead and buried, unnoted by the settler systems, but never, ever forgotten by their siblings, their parents, their communities. We grieve for the Indigenous children taken from their homes and parents by the government handed over to the responsibility of the Christian Church, the children who died under its care, never to be held by their families, never to be returned to their communities, not only the 215 children and other Indigenous communities that experienced this along the West Coast and Interior whose bodies have now been found on the grounds of the Kamloops Indian Residential School grounds, not only these, but all those children whose bodies have not yet been found, who died in any of the Indian residential schools. We grieve for the survivors of the Indian residential schools, the children who did not did come home, but were changed by their experience, the children who grew up and have the trauma of remembering again what happened to them. Even as we give thanks for their families and communities, we hold the stories of the children who have kept searching and keep searching. We grieve that the search is even necessary, that even one child was taken, that even one child died, that even one death of a child went unnoted by the system. Help us to stop, to sit in silence, to remember the names we do not know. May their spirits have peace and their bodies be brought home to their lands. And God, help us to take this grief, this shock, this horror, and turn it into right action, action that works for right relations, action that works for healing and justice and hope. And please, don't let those of us who are settlers and descendants of settlers, newcomers to this land, let the horror, the shock, and the grief just be an outpouring of words or tears or ineffectual hand wringing. Please God, let this be a moment of change, a moment that transforms the brokenness, that we might walk in right relations for the good of your children for the good of your world. Please, God, these things we pray in the name of the one who brought creation into being, in the name of Jesus, our teacher and our friend, in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose wings spread across the sky. Amen and amen. We read in Joel chapter 2, verse 13, this exhortation. 
Return to the Lord your God, for God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is the good news of the gospel. Therefore, let us sing to the glory of God. With this joy of grace accepted in our hearts and the promise to be a reconciled and reconciling people moving forward, we sing now together. I'll invite you to join in singing Spirit of the Living God. The Prayer of Illumination Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The Scripture Introduction There were more than 600 commandments in the Jewish law, and it was common to debate and ask leaders and teachers which of these have priority over the others. In answering the question, Jesus gives not one, but two commandments. Love your God with your whole heart and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Both answers are taken from the Law of Moses, found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. We note that Jesus gives his own interpretation to these two commandments. In his view, the two commandments are inseparable. We cannot love God and then refuse to love our neighbor. Jesus extends the meaning of neighbor to include every single person and not just the people of one's own race, religion, or family. The way Jesus answers the question, what is the greatest commandment, speaks volumes about what his followers believe to be foundational beliefs in a benevolent, all-loving, creative, and creating God. The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the witness of the early church and the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Many of you may be familiar with the official signature of the United Church of Canada in image form. The official signature of the United Church of Canada is the crest. It's a spiritual and historic reminder of who we are where we have come from and who we are today. And for church members, this insignia is this reminder of our spiritual beliefs and our history. 
it has an oval shape to it, if you've seen it, and that shape is taken from the fish symbol that was an identity symbol for early Christians. The initials of the word Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, in Greek spells ichthus, which is the Greek word for fish, so the symbol, shape. And then the X at the center, the first letter of the Greek word for Christ, is a traditional symbol for Christ. And in the four corners of the crest are symbols, three of which are particularly associated with the three large groups, churches, communions, Congregational, Methodist, and Presbyterian that united to form the United Church of Canada in 1925. History lesson continues. The Open Bible that is a symbol represents the Congregational churches with their emphasis upon God's truth that makes people free, and from this communion, we have this heritage of liberty in prophesying, love of spiritual freedom, awareness of the creative power of the Holy Spirit, and clear witness for civic justice. That's the symbol of the open Bible. And the symbol of the dove is a representation of the Holy Spirit. And the dove is a transforming power, and it's been this distinctive mark of the Methodist Church, Methodism. Here our heritage is one of evangelical zeal, concern for human redemption. And evangelical, I, I mean sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus. Enthusiasm is what's meant by zeal. Enthusiasm for sharing who Jesus is and telling the story of God. And here our heritage continues to have a concern for human redemption, for the warmth of Christian fellowship, sharing time together in prayer and in worship, and in the ministry of sacred song, the testimony, sharing our stories in spiritual experience. So that's the dove, the Holy Spirit um, symbol. The burning bush is the symbol of Presbyterianism on the crest. And it refers to the bush that burned and was not consumed in Ezekiel, or sorry, in Exodus chapter three. And it symbolizes the indestructibility of the church that the Presbyterians believe and is true. And from Presbyterianism, we've received a heritage of high regard for dignity in worship, the education of all people, the authority of scripture, and the church as the body of Christ. And then the fourth symbol is the Alpha and Omega in the lower quadrant, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. And these symbolize what we believe about God, that God is eternal, the fullness of creation. And then on the sides of the crest, the Latin words, ut umnes unum sint, surround the symbols on the crest. And they mean that all may be one that all may be one. And those are taken from the book of John, chapter 17, verse 21. They're a reminder that we are both a united and uniting church. And then in 1980, a French translation of the United Church of Canada, l'Église Unie du Canada, was added and authorized by the General Council to the crest. So these changes happened not a lot. The crest happened in 1944, and then in 1980, French was added. And then in 2012, and I was at this general council in Ottawa, I remember firsthand the discussions and the symbolism we were walked through the why of what was changing. Because the crest before, up until 2012, behind those symbols, the crest had navy blue on it. But now, the why behind why we would give up this, the, the colors behind that to say something meaningful from a tradition that is involved in our united and uniting churches. The Indigenous Church has been with the church in Canada, the United Church, from the beginning. And actually at that very same General Council in 2012 in Ottawa, it was rectified that there was no acknowledgement that the Indigenous Church joined the Union at the time. But that is in fact what happened. The Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Congregationalists, and the Indigenous Churches represented in the Methodist, the Presbyterian, and some Congregational Churches 
joined as well, not all, but most of them joined to be a part of the union. And that was not acknowledged until 2012 and then represented in the crest in the symbol. And so what happened was we as a United Church said, we've made a mistake. We have not represented the fullness of the body of Christ here in Canada, and we want to do something about that. And for me, being a part of the explanation of the why, I had the privilege of hearing stories and how people were affected by this, and then experiencing. They gave us all a new pin that we got to wear. I didn't bring mine today. It's at home in my jewelry box, but I have one um, that has the yellow, the red, the black, and the white, the medicine wheel of the Aboriginal teachings. The crest changed as well with the addition to include the Mohawk phrase, Agwe Nyade Dewa Neren, which means all my relations. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about this change, what the United Church did and why, because that was a mistake to not include and acknowledge the Indigenous Church from the beginning. And it was not until 2012 that we made a symbolic gesture to do that and then rectified that in writing by saying the Indigenous Church exists within the United Church of Canada and is a part of the United Church of Canada. And so there was all these documents that came out of that and all this work that the church did to call the church into right relation with the indigenous church that already existed but was not being acknowledged in power or in presence. So today, when we think about the mistakes of our past, what that has meant, and then consider where we are today and how we want to be moving forward as followers of Jesus who are seeking to reconcile and make new, that God would work in us by his spirit, by her spirit, I want to think with you about what that means today, how we can do that, not just symbolically, but with our symbols is good, but also in our day-to-day -day life, what that means for us when we think about how we go about our lives in our workplaces, in our traffic culture, in the systems that we operate in, from the sidewalks to the streets. Melinda Elizabeth Berry is an American writer, and I think this has parallels in Canada as well, but it's, it's obviously American, so I'm giving you that caveat. Berry writes this, listen. The doctrine of discovery that allowed colonial powers to seize indigenous land with impunity is the originating sin of the United States of America. It has so infected the consciousness of white Western Christians that many of us reflexively consider the idea of indigenous Christianity to be inherently syncretistic. But the invitation to decolonize our faith can help us to see how our own colonial conception of Christianity is actually what is synchronistic with the faith. Our faith, and she's writing in America, our faith has blended American exceptionalism, nationalism, capitalism, militarism, and patriarchy until questioning any of the latter is taken as an affront to the former, to Christianity. These have been blended so much. So she goes on to say, decolonizing is thus another name for what Jesus calls repentance, turning away from systems of violence and empire in order to embrace the nonviolent kingdom of heaven as those with pure hearts who seek the righteousness and justice of God. Okay, so that's a lot. Deconstruction is examining the systems in which we grew up in, beginning to look at what holds these systems up and who these systems serve and benefit and who these systems marginalize, capitalize on. 
That's what deconstruction begins to look like. Decolonization, on the other hand, is an invitation and a gift for humankind to re-establish correct relations with each other and the earth, recognizing that we are all kin. Decolonizing lays aside the systems and the structures and the deconstructures, deconstructions, and focuses on all my relations, examining the systems and dismantling the hierarchy and the patriarchy, unwrapping these systems and taking them all apart. I want to encourage you to do this with joy. Thank the systems for what they gifted you with, and then throw out the parts that are harmful or don't serve you or especially others anymore. If we can deconstruct and decolonize without becoming cynical, angry, then we maintain what actually is a deep faith in Christ. Jesus was a nomad, a refugee. He owned no land, and he claimed his citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, not on earth. There's no doubt that Christianity has been the handmaiden to the destruction of indigenous nations. And a recent book by an author named Caitlin Curtis tipped me off to this. Her book is called Native, and she's a millennial age author and writer who grows up, she tells this in her book, a foot in two worlds, reconciling her identity, a mother deeply rooted in the Baptist traditions and church-going cultures of America. Caitlin grew up in church, going to youth group, learning about God and being a churched person. And her father, whose citizenship is with the Padua tribe, Caitlin is a self-described card-carrying native and a Christian. And this reality is inset into her whole life story. And in this most recent book of hers, Native, it's an indigenization of faith. And more importantly, it's a moral call, not only to the Christian church, but for everyone to reckon with the genocidal legacies of settler colonialism and slavery. As she humbly puts it, decolonization is an invitation and a gift for humankind to re-establish correct relations with each other and the earth. And I want to quote Caitlin here and give her the mic for a moment to share her wisdom. Listen for her words. She says, if anything, the church has lost its ability to find its place in the midst of sacred creation. The church has been power hungry for too long and has forgotten its need to stay humble and gentle, to learn from the world and the creation in it and to learn from the least of these when it has lost its way. We lost our way when prayer became a weapon that we wielded toward others we thought needed saving. Whoa. It is enduringly hard work, but if we are going to participate in dismantling some of these dangerous and oppressive systems, then we've got to look our trauma in the eye and the trauma that others have experienced and hold the institutions and the systems and the people accountable that caused that trauma. Here's a start. Let's listen as the wider church to the wisdom and calls to action from the indigenous church. This is within the United Church of Canada, explicitly Canadian, directly from the 2012 General Council. All of these documents and work were done and the end of all of the listening and the sacred circles and the indigenous church speaking was these documents of calls to action for the church. You can find them by going on the United Church of Canada website, or if you're curious, you can ask one of your ministers and we will point you in the right direction to read the full documents. But here's what they say. 
The United Church has apologized for its colonial application of the policy of assimilation and acknowledged its impoverishment by the rejection of an indigenous understanding of spirituality. It is the desire to live into right relations with a repentant church and pursue the original indigenous desire for friendship, peace, and the strength that comes from respect. The indigenous church speaks and says, the indigenous church will be an instrument of healing our identity and a place of renewal of our cultures. Our roots have been broken by colonialism and we will restore them. Wounds came from being told we were wrong and the loss of language and culture. Our recovery from these negative influences means that we must have a process that is trauma-informed. We won't be healed simply by Western medical models, but a trauma-informed approach. It is not helpful to treat people who struggle with addictions as criminals, but rather we must take a healing approach. The colonial system has been dehumanizing for both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. We will expand our work from the end of life to the beginning of life. We will restore the whole circle of life, infancy and childhood, youth, adult and elder stages. We will maintain right relations with the broader United Church and educate them about our need to indigenize our work and decolonize what continues to harm us. I love that and I love this next part. Listen, we have faith that the Spirit of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of creation and the love of God will move us forward on the road of true reconciliation so that we can know the beloved community of all our relations. So as the wider church, as the United Church, we listen as the Indigenous Church speaks. And those were direct quotes from these documents, the call to the church, and a statement about who the Indigenous Church is and wants to be. And I think it's important for us to note that more and more Christians are learning the beautiful and unique contributions First Peoples bring to the reading of Scripture. Genesis 1, for instance, depicts not humankind's superiority over everything in creation, but humans' dependency and interdependency on everything in it. Human beings need air, need water and light and fish and flocks and fruit to survive and flourish. And yet, none of these things need us. Everything else in creation flourishes independent of human existence. Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber, who many of you may remember as the guest preacher for the celebration of ministry here in the Pacific Mountain region just this past week, Nadia Boltz Weber read Caitlin Curtis's book, Native, and professed, after reading Native, I may just touch a tree now and again and see it as a prayer. Amen. Yes. Curtis is both a writer and a poet, and I want to give the mic to her for a moment, and I'm going to read one of her poems for us as we close. This is a poem by Caitlin Curtis, the author of Native. Prayer is only a whisper of what could be, what is, the memory of what was yesterday, ten minutes ago, when we last blinked, and realized that what you are is something we cannot grasp, but long to know in the depths of us. Make room, for we are simply beginning, the sprout that will grow and form the landscape of tomorrow. Breathe on us, we pray. Heal. Amen. It is so good and so healthy to recognize that no culture has the corner on the market of how to live in this world. We have so much to learn from one another because each of us, every human being, bears the divine image of our divine creator, God. And in some way, this mirrors God into the world. Indigenous ways of belonging help remind us that when we invest in the good of the earth, 
the good of one another, when we invest in the good of creature, kin, we invest in a better, more equitable future for all of us. So the invitation is to practice holding space instead of holding one another hostage to our own ideals. Let's remember that the God of grace has an individual vision for each of us, for you, for me, for our church, and for our world. And let's let God give us the vision of a world made new. That vision of a world made new in God's love is so much grander, so much full of beauty and mystery, more than we can ever ask or imagine. And so we're invited to hold space for that vision. It is sacred and good and worth waiting for. Amen. Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer together as we respond to God's word. Will you pray with me? O oh God, we come together as a human family, blessed to be alive, blessed to be on this land, blessed to have neighbors as diverse as your creation. You surround us, O oh God, with air as we breathe, water we drink, all manner of living plants and animals that delight and sustain us. Thank you, Creator, for all your peoples, all you provide. We take a moment in silence to ponder the blessings you give, have given, and will give to us, Creator God, of family, friends, places to call home, the food we eat, the web of life in which we are one with all creation. Hear us as we give thanks. O oh God, we thank you for indigenous neighbors and friends this day, and yet we lament too. We lament that historic and contemporary racism continues to mar our relations. We lament the church's role as beneficiaries of an economic and government system that privileges settler peoples at the expense of the first peoples of this land. We lament apathy in the face of the need for change 
change that recognizes the sovereignty of the First Peoples and recognizes at long last, in ways that make a difference, the sacredness of the land and the need for all of us to walk humbly upon it. O oh God, for the witness of strength, caring, and love of Indigenous people, and for the struggle for what is just and right, open our hearts this day. Encourage each one of us, O oh God, to listen more, speak less, participate in the movements for change that will bring us together in good and respectful ways. Encourage us to make friends, get to know someone's story, and share our stories too, without fear. For in Christ we know we are all kin, relatives with you and with each other, and with all living and non-living things. Hear us now as we pray for those hurting and in pain in all our communities. We pray for anyone worn down by systemic racism, including by government and by the church, that white people and those with power will change their thinking and how they live so that justice will finally come. We pray for anyone suffering the injustice of racial profiling, ending up involved with the law, incarcerated in prison at a higher rate than any other population, that policing will change so that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for survivors of residential schools and their families that continue to live with the legacy that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For people on reserves living with shortages of funds for decent housing, water, water treatment, schools, and other community infrastructure, that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Indigenous neighbors living in urban areas, facing the challenges of prejudice and discrimination. For those living with PTSD and addiction, we pray that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Indigenous women and girls facing the two evils of racism and sexism, that their lives and bodies would be respected as sacred, that justice would finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those women and girls of Indigenous background who are among the thousand murdered and missing. For them and their families, our lament at the shame of what has happened and our pledge to advocate for their safety, that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the air, that all might breathe clean and free, that justice might finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the waters, marshlands, lakes, rivers, and streams, for the great seas and oceans, that they might be protected for the benefit of seven generations hence, that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the lands, forests, grass, and farmlands, for the prairies, foothills, and mountains, for their beauty, for the life that teems within, upon, and over them, for the reprioritization of the health of ecosystems over profit, so justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the animals, birds, fish, and life of all kinds whose viability is being threatened by unsustainable human activity, that their lives will begin to count so that justice will finally come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this, as well as the prayers of our hearts, O oh God, we lift up to you. Hear our celebrations as we claim anew our kinship with you and with all our relations. Hear our laments, O oh God, and grow our hearts full of compassion for self and for others as we leave this place to be a better friend and a better neighbor to all. We pray in the name of Creator, who is mystery, mother, and father of us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
We pray now the prayer that Jesus taught his friends and followers. Loving God, in whom is heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A word of thanks for those of you who are continuing to give during this COVID time, during all of the separations, recognizing that Deer Lake United is grateful for anything that you might give. Just a word that if you do give and already are doing that, you know what to do. If you're not familiar, you can go to deerlakeunited.ca and click on the donate link at the top of the page. One more announcement before we move on in our worship service. Um, our pianist today I wanna thank is the sister of the regular music director, Donna. Donna's sister, Connie, has been playing piano for us today. Donna fell and injured her hand and has had a cast on. It's coming off this week, I hear. For those of you who are praying for her, please keep her in your prayers. Her fingerprints are all over the music because she carefully chose what would go with the scriptures and the theme of today, but her fingers were not able to play them for us. So Connie is filling in. Um, Donna, we are praying for you. And Lord, we just pray that your healing hand would be on Donna and on her doctors for wisdom for how long she needs to be away from her beloved piano. Um, we just pray for your healing, oh God continued prayers for that. I'll invite you to join now in our closing hymn, To Show by Touch and Word. It's from Voices United. Let's sing together. blessing and benediction for us all as we leave this time of worship. As God's united yet diverse peoples, we go to become good neighbors to one another and to the earth. For in Christ we are all kin. We are called to be neighbors, to share generously with one another. As we learn more, respect more, love more, we can all gain, not lose. God as creator will be our rock, Christ and spirit be our guides. Amen and amen. 
You are warmly invited now to join in the fellowship time that is hosted over on the Zoom platform directly following the musical postlude. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.